Okay, welcome back. Hopefully you feel nourished, happy, checked your emails, everything good? Sorry? 저희 오후 세션 2시부터 시작을 하고요. 저희 일정표에 나눠 드렸던 거에 대해 약간 변경이 있어서 우선은 <웃음> 이제 발표하시는 분이 조금 더 Q&A 부분이랑 디스커션 부분을 조금 더 많이 시간을 할애하는 게 도움을 드릴 수 있을 거라고 생각을 하셔서 3시 반까지 브레이크 타임 없이 쭉 강의는 진행을 하고 이제 끝나고 이제 그 중간 중간에 3시부터 커피랑 쿠키는 이제 자유롭게 왔다 갔다 하시면서 드시면 되고요. 3시 반부터 바로 Q&A 타임 가지는 걸로 얘기를 했거든요. 그렇게 해 주시면 될것 같고 이제 Q&A 시간에 혹시 이제 질문 있으신 분들은 저희 드렸던 노트패드 이런 데 적어서 내셔도 되고 그리고 조금 오픈하기가 좀 그런 질문 같은 경우에는 추후에 이제 이메일로 영사이언스로 보내 주셔도 되고 아니면 교재 뒤에 나와 있는 이제 메일로 직접 보내 주셔도 되고 되고요. 그렇게 해서 이제 질문 진행하는 걸로 저희 워크숍 진행하겠습니다. 오케이, okay, welcome back. Um, yeah, we're just looking at the timing and we're making good progress. We're getting through the key ideas. So, yes, we'll finish up the presentation. We'll definitely keep it open for Q&A. And if for some reason we didn't answer your question during that, uh, email, I'm sure you explained that, so great. Okay, um, so the next things I want to show you is a little bit more, um, not just concept, but a little bit more demonstration so I can show you um, the ideas. Um, I'm a very practical person, so for me, a lot of times you can tell me the idea, but if I don't see what you're doing, I don't really understand it. So what I want to do is demonstrate a little bit of this as well, and I've got a few demonstrations and simulations I'll walk you through. So the next thing we want to look at is the process characterization, uh, establishing NOR and PAR limits, and identifying critical process parameters. So, uh, and then the follow-on from that is generating the transfer functions, establishing the DOE, doing the design space, and all that. So really five and six are what really comes next. So let's take a look at that. So again, this kind of lays out what we're trying to show for process understanding. And six, let's take a look at the demonstration. So a lot of times we said that the problem with characterization of a process is it has way too many factors and way too little data. So the first thing is, is how do we organize all the potential factors? Usually when we're doing factor selection, we find them from very different specific areas. We find them from um, equipment and equipment settings. We find them from the sequence or the order of operation. We find them from the materials that we're using. So usually those are the three areas that we look to to think about what those might be. And then again, we are trying to formalize or create the design space. The design space is also a not entirely correct in the sense that the FDA says that it's the operational space where the product is good. But when you create these design spaces, it's not really a true representation. So I'll show you that. There's two analyses that you should have, and you might want to write this down because this idea is a big one. Uh, on one side, you have the design space. That shows you how your process is performing on the average, not by the batch. So that's the, the design space is a little bit of a lie in the sense that it shows you where the average process performance is relative to your limits. On the other side, we have another type of analysis referred to as the edge of failure. The edge of failure actually evaluates every batch relative to limits. So we're going to see the two of those. ICH calls out both of those. So ICHQ8 talks about design space, and they also talk about the edge of failure. So I'm going to show you what those look like practically. This picture is from ICHQ8, and they're showing what they think a design space looks like. The white area means in specification. The shaded area or colored area means out of specification, OOS. So um, that's what it says. And again, we start with the risk assessment, trying to figure out what's critical. I personally like the low-level risk assessment. ICH recommends a fishbone diagram. Normally that's not good because you can't tell what's critical, so I don't prefer. This is okay, but not very good. 
This is better. This is one that was done by Merck um, and um, in drug manufacturing, um, particularly in doing a coded tablet. Um, so they're showing the key characteristics of the process. They're showing where each unit operation characterization was. So there you can see what factors they evaluated. And then they showed where their PAT was being measured at key steps in the process and then where the finished goods came out. So this is a better, little better picture of what that might look like. This is similar, a little bit similar to our high level risk assessment. What the problem with this is, there is no, the only thing that's wrong with this picture, where's the CQA? There's no connection to the CQAs. So you just have to assume that they're saying API blending for API composition, intergranular lubrication for dissolution, they don't tell you what, AP, what CQA is relevant to this. So this type of diagram is good, but I don't think it's quite as good as the high-level risk assessment because no line of sight. You can't see how the CQA and the unit operations are connecting. This is normally the workflow. This is a good, good slide that shows you the workflow. Before that, be, so the one thing that's missing in this workflow is it doesn't say that there's a risk assessment. Low level risk assessment is first. So if you want to write that on your, on your slide there, the low level risk assessment would precede this first and then that we would go into a DOE design. The DOE design and the low level risk assessment should have line of sight, should be connected. So those should be tied together. Then we run the experiment, we build the model equation. These are usually some form of a linear equation. Um, and then from that we optimize it to determine the best set point. And then from that, we visualize what that design space looks like. We then do the simulation to figure out the design margin and the edge of failure analysis. Then we establish NOR and PAR ranges. And then the very, very last step is scale up. So most experimental work is done at small scale. Two liter, five liter, 10 liter scale, small scale, half liter. So a lot of times the problem with that is the, uh, I, I was working on a project with the nice people at Genentech. Their, at Genentech, their vessels are 25,000 liters, but the experimental work was done at two liters. So how do I take two liter DOE characterization and convince myself on what that would do at 25,000 liters, right? Big scale up uh, effect. So. I, if, if you're interested in how do you do a small scale DOE and make that predicted of a large scale, I have a nice paper on that uh, on scale up. So if you type in my, if you Google my name and type in scale up, you'll see a nice paper that explains how you take small scale experimentation and match that to your at scale process. The logic is, uh, as far as I know, the only papers that really explain how that connection is done properly. Okay, well, let's take a look. So again, risk assessment starts, and then we go into a DOE design. Now, to make this a little bit easier for you guys, um, I just have an example, and I'll just work with you on that, and I'll take jump, I'll open it up, and I'll just walk you through an actual uh, example to show you what that sort of would look like. So in this particular study, this is a 16-run experiment. Uh, this is referred to as a custom design, or it's also referred to as a de-optimal design. And over here, I have several factors. I have load, temperature, salt, and flow. And so these are the four factors that I'm evaluating. Um, just as a rule of thumb, for characterization studies, normally they're about four to eight factors. After you do your risk assessment on a single unit operation, most unit operations can be adequately characterized between four to eight factors. That's a good kind of rule of thumb. It's not absolute, but it's a very, very good guidance to think about when you're character. If you say it's two factors, it's probably more complicated. If you tell me it's 15 factors, we can probably simplify. So four to eight is a really good kind of guidance to think about how big of an experiment you would really like to run. This is a typical one. So here's a four-factor study, and then they're going to look at uh, characterization, and they're going to do that in 16 runs. Over here, they're going to measure titer. Titer is not a quality attribute, but it is a productivity measure 
So it's perfectly good to include that. Concentration is a CQA, and high molecular weight species is also an impurity, so that's also a CQA as well. So there's two CQAs and one measure of productivity. So the first step in the analysis is we have to do what is called model building. And so I'll build one model for you. Just so, Is this interesting to you? Would you like to see this? Yeah? I mean, I don't have to show it. Yeah? Do it? Let me ask again. You want to see this or don't care? See it. Okay, let's do it. So here we go. So we come on over here. And so the first thing we do, so this is what I'm going to show you or demonstrate to you is how to analyze it, then how to optimize it, and then how to set the design space, and then how to set the edge of failure. So all the things, the deliverables, we're going to need. I'll show it all to you. So I'll walk you through it quickly. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fit a model to each and every one of these. Let me just do one of them so you can see one, and then I'll do them all. So let me remove that. So tighter, let's say that I want to analyze tighter. These are all my factors that I'm interested in looking at, So and plus the model term, so it has main effects. It also has interaction effects in there too. And I'm just going to click on Run, and that will build the model for me. So behind the scenes, it's built a model. So there is the model equation. It's built. Let me turn on my highlighter so I can see that just one second. Um, where is that? Laser pointer. Red's a good color. Apply that. There we go. Cool. So now I can highlight things. So over here, this is my model equation. I have fit a model. This model explains almost 100% of the change in the titer. So, but some of the factors that are in this model are not significant. So the ones in red are significant, but the rest of them are not significant. So what I can do is do something called clean up the model. So I'm going to do that. I'm going fast. I don't expect you to see everything, but just to kind of get a feel for what would it look like uh, if I did it. So I'm going to go over here and do stepwise to remove the non-significant terms. So I say go. Uh, let's see. I'm going to have to go the other way. Uh, P-value threshold, enter all, 0 0.05, backwards, and go. So it's now selected the model. So it said load, temperature, salt, flow rate. These are the ones that are important factors. And temp, temp, salt concentration squared, salt flow rate. This is nothing. And then I click on make model and tell it to run the model. And now it's built the model. So there is my simplified model for the process. It has these terms in it, which are now significant. So I've got all the statistically significant terms in the model with their sensitivity. So one of the things that the FDA has specifically asked for is where is the equation? If you think you've characterized the process, where's the equation? So this is another thing that we're going to need, and we have it right here. So I'm going to show the prediction expression. So there is the actual equation right there. So it's, and this will be included in my report. When I can show the agencies that I have this equation, I have process understanding. That tells me that for every unit change in the load, what's that going to do to my titer, et cetera. So what is the temperature effect on titer, and so forth. So there is my understanding. Again, if you cannot show this level of information, you don't know. So that, what we're looking for is called the model equation or the prediction equation. So that's what we need. Okay, well, I've already done the work for that. And so I've, I've created each one of these models already. And I've put them over here on the side to be a little bit more efficient. So I've got these all right here. So here is the equation for concentration. And so Jump's got these all done for me. And if I double click on them, it turns them into text files. So usually when I'm writing a report for submission work, I just copy and paste that into my report, which says, do you understand the sensitivities of all these factors in this unit operation? Yes, I do. Thank you for asking. Copy, paste. It's in my Word document. And now they have it. They have said, both EMA and FDA, in a letter two years ago, they said, quit showing us pretty graphs. Give us the equation. If you give us the equation, we know what you know. So they want the equation in the submission. If you don't show equations in your submissions, you probably don't know. So very important point. 
Okay, well, once we have that, we can start to think about uh, building an overall profiler. Let's see if I have that. Yep, I do. So what I can do then is I can take that equation and put that into an overall profiler. And what this is going to help me to do is it's going to help me to figure out um, the various settings that I would like to run my process at. So by doing that, I can show the sensitivities for load, temperature, salt, and flow rate. I can also look for the interactions on that as well. So those are all the cross terms. These are all the interactions for titer. Uh, the next one is all the interactions for concentration. And uh, here's all the interactions for high molecular weight. So every CQA that you wanted me to evaluate, every measure of productivity, I have those sensitivities. Plus I have the equation. Okay, um, if I, so I can try changing the set point and I can see dynamically what will happen to my process. And then I can also record or remember my best setting. So here's my best setting. And I can see how that performs. Now, visually, if you look up here, here is my CQA limit. So here's my limit right here. And here's the distribution. So I'm going to run 100,000 batches. Let me just set this up. I'll run a simulation. Simulator. I'll run 100,000 batches. Running 100,000 batches this way, so much easier than trying to run them on the line. So this is a simulation. And you can see that as I look up here, I see that here's my limit. I see the full distribution. And it tells me on tighter, my failure rate is 0.001%. That's very low on percent. So I'm going to change that to PPM, parts per million. So that says it's about 110 ppm. And if I hit the simulate button, every time I hit simulate, it will run 100,000 batch trials for me through the simulator. Um, FDA has, and there's multiple guidance documents that say that simulation is an acceptable method to look at the high volume potential for your drug. So when you did only 16 runs through your small scale study, but then you can simulate 100,000 batches through the computer. And that simulation is considered an acceptable understanding of that design space. So it's the DOE was measured. The model is based on measurement. The simulate, simulation is based on the variation at set point extrapolated up through the model. So we, we use that process model to explore marginality. You'll notice that over here, everything's good. Over here, you'll notice that everything's bad. 14% failure on this. Let's see if I can get that font size a little bit bigger. Yep. So you can see that I'm getting about 14% failure right here. And that translates to 14, 140,000 PPM. Terrible, 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 terrible. So I've got a really horrible result. You'll notice that I have reasonably high sensitivity to flow, I have high sensitivity to temperature, and I've got a lot of OOS outside the spec limits. So either one of two things is true. The spec limits are wrong, possible, or I've got to tighten up the limits on those parameters. So this is something that I want to be able to go explore. And even though my set point may be good, my limits don't look good. So the simulator helps me to do that. These standard DEVs are based on process knowledge. It says if you put in a certain load, what would be one standard deviation on that load? If you put in a certain temperature, what would one standard deviation be of that temperature? What's your temperature control in that ves vessel or on that process? If this is your salt concentration uh, or salt amount, how, do you, how well can you control that within one standard D? And then what about your flow rate? Uh, how well can you control that? So, these allow us to put in that information and then run simulations against that. A good rule for a drug program is you should be at 100 ppm or less. A good rule that you might consider when evaluating a CQA is when you run these simulations, you would like to see that at 100 ppm or lower in order to consider good quality. So if you're at 1,000 ppm, 10,000 ppm, 100,000 ppm, you're in big trouble. And we've got to do something about the limits, the targets, or the control strategy, or rethink the specifications. Those are all possible, but we have to get that fixed. OK, the next thing that we want to look at, so kind of think about our flow. DOE design, 
that DOE design creates a model equation. The model equation then creates the profiler, and then from the profiler, we can run the simulation. Now, while we're at it, let's go take a look at the design space. So the design space is created by creating a contour plot. The contour plot shows us how the temperature and load influences the three quality attributes. So here's titer. Uh, titer is in red. The formula concentration is in green. And the formula high molecular weight is in blue. So if you look over here in the graph, this blue area is out of spec for high molecular weight. The red area is out of spec for titer, what you would want for the titer. And the green area is concentration for dose. So you can kind of see in our current set point where we've selected our current set point is right there. And that white area is considered the design space. Now, to see the design space, you're going to have to see it as multidimensional, right? So, there's, so there is the load temperature design space. There is the load flow design space. So you have to show like eight or nine graphs to show the design space. Each one's copied and pasted and put in the report. So jump doesn't show you all of the pictures in one plot. It creates them one by one, and you have to transfer them into the report to show the design space. And that's normal. That's what, that's what this is. Now, take a look at this just for a moment with the new eyes that we've talked about. We said that really QBD is really all about what's new, what's exciting about QBD, what's the big thing? Control. If you didn't get that yet, don't forget. <laughs> so now take a look. Which factor would you choose as your control parameter for tighter? Just looking at what's there. Would you pick salt? Mm, for tighter? For the first one? For the top one? Would you pick this one as your primary? Would you pick this one as your primary control? No. Would you pick temperature? Yep. Uh, how about flow? Maybe. But this one has the best sensitivity, right? So if you really wanted to control tighter, temperature may be a consideration. Uh, what about concentration? Well, that's sort of, again, flow and temperature. How about the impurity? What's controlling the impurity? Load. Load and maybe the flow. So you can see, depending on the CQA, from a properly designed DOE, you should be able to easily pick out where your control parameters and where you might want a design space. So imagine as the column ages, Right? As you're loading, 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 and using that column, what's going to happen to its purification capacity? As time goes on, it will get not so good. Might you choose to lower the load? Keep using the column for a little longer, but just drop down the load a little bit. So those are all possibilities with design space. Right? You could say this is the range of load that you can use. Anything in that load range is acceptable. And we would only need to go to the lower load when the column ages. And we need a little bit more purity out of the column. So we can think about things like that. And people have filed things like that as well. It makes for good science. It makes for good process. It makes for good performance. OK, so I've done all that. I know my target, so I know my load, I know my temperature, I know my salt concentration, I know my flow rate. But I don't like these yields. That's not good. 14, 140,000 ppm, that's terrible. So the next thing I want to do is to do simulation to table. So let me show you what that looks like. So what we do, 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 do. let me see if I can show it to you. Yeah. Yes, so here's 100,000 batches that we've then thrown out to the table to run a simulation to table. And what we do with that is we, create, we construct a plot called the edge of failure analysis. Now, if you look at this graph, these are my limits. And what I really want is everything in spec, green. Anything that goes out of spec is going to be OOS. So the question is, what are the ranges of these factors that I can allow to guarantee that all my batch runs will be in spec. Now, 
I cannot afford to do this at scale. Too expensive. And the learning is too slow. So I have to learn how to do this with the simulation. So you can see that if that temperature goes out of control, what's going to happen? Oh my gosh. We're going to have terrible OOSs, right? So you can see that this allows us a dynamic visualization to figure out where are the actual operating parameters that we can stay within. And if you go outside those ranges, what's going to happen to your OOS rates? This has to be done through experimentation. It cannot be done at scale. It has to be done through DOE. This is specifically called out. If you want to really look at what I'm telling you, go read ICHQ8, look up Two things, design space and edge of failure. And they'll describe this process I'm showing to you right now. They want it. They're asking for it. They want to see it in your submissions. So if you show this, it shows a level of te technical sophistication that is really uh, very compelling to the agencies. They love it. Like, this is my understanding. This is my target. These are the operational limits. What will happen if you go outside those limits? We're going to go OS. Okay, okay, okay. You know. Yes, we know. If you know, then we know you know. Smiley face, two thumbs up, happy, good emoji, everything good. <laughs> okay, so this is a cool, easy to do way method for exploring that design space. This is the truth. The design space is a lie. The design space is not really right. You cannot say, by looking at this design space, this is what's not true. You cannot say that everything in the white will be good. That is not true. On the average, it will be good, but not on the batch. So that's, if you want to pick, make a note, the thing that makes a design space not really true is it is not a true representation of, that everything in the white area will be good. That's not true. But if you do the edge of failure analysis, everything within these limits will be good. That's true. That's true, that's true. This is for the batch. Edge of failure is for the batch. Design space is for the average. Let me say it one more time. Design space is not for the batch. It doesn't mean that every batch in the white area will be good. It is not true. It means that the average will be good across that area. That's correct. And the edge of failure shows it on individual batches. So again, when you open up these ranges or you diminish these ranges, you should be able to see that everything will be in spec. Or if you go outside those ranges, you will have OOS. Edge of failure is the correct one. So let me label that for you. The edge of failure analysis is the one that will really do that for you and be accurate and representative. OK, we talked about the design. Again, one more thing on the design of a DOE. Make sure this, if you want to just make a note or two, make sure that the risk assessment and the design match. If the risk assessment and the design matches, then you have line of sight. Perfect, that's what you want. And on review, uh, this is what you said is important, yeah. And this DOE has these important factors. Yeah, got it. So we want to make sure that there's the connection between the two. Again, we create the model. Oh, I, I knew there was one thing I was missing. CPPs. So let me show you that as well. Critical process parameters. Is that important? Is defining critical process parameters important in our work? It is. So how do we get that? So let me show you what that looks like. When you fit a model to the data, one of the things that every design of experiment generates is something called the effect size. This is called the effect size. This is in your notes. This is the actual effect size. This is the change in the CQA. So this one will show it to you. A lot of times we'll sort that. Let me sort that by the scaled estimate. 
So there you are. You see that the number one thing influencing titer, so if you said, where are the control parameters? Which factor is the most important? There they are. So number one is load. Number two is load squared. Number three is temperature by salt interaction. And then on and on all the way to the bottom. So this shows us in the, the effect of the product. It's measured in units. So if you're measuring high molecular weight, it's in high molecular weight percent. If you're measuring titer, it's in titer. If you're measuring concentration, it's in concentration. So the question is, how does the factor affect concentration? That's the answer. So this is in units of the response. It shows you, and then from this, we calculate whether it's a CPP. We said 20% or more is critical. 10 to 20, key, less than 10, non-critical. So you can see how that, and then you can compare your risk assessment, what you thought it was, what you believe it is, to what it measured. Here's what we believe, here's what it is, line of sight. So the risk assessment shows what you think, and then the DOE shows you what it does. And now you can compare and show how, how well do we really understand it. We might make a new discovery, we didn't know that, or we might realize that what we originally believed was Correct, yes. That we said it would be the number one thing. It is the number one thing. So please do not think that critical process parameters should be evaluated using FMEA. That is a wrong method. It is not a risk assessment. You don't use risk assessment to measure CPPs. CPPs are measured. They're reported as a function of the factors. They're not a risk assessment. The risk assessments do the high level. Where are unit operations with risk? The risk assessments identify factors in the study. They don't identify CPPs. Anybody that's doing CPPs with a risk assessment is using the wrong technique. There's a good example of what I just said. There's our sensitivities using profilers. So there's that whole piece. That is such an important part of what we're doing in this quality by design. Now, what you just saw, so let me go back to this just for a moment. What you just saw from the experiment, right? Experiment to a model, model to a profiler, profiler to a set point, to limits, operational space. So that's done in three application areas, so I would recommend you write this down. What you just saw, the DOE protocol and everything you just saw is used in three areas. Number one, formulation. Number two, analytical methods. And number three, process, unit operations. So we apply that to three places. Formulation for stability. Formulation DOEs are for stability modeling. The analytical methods are for robustness per ICHQ2, mandatory. So DOEs for methods are for robustness. They're specifically for accuracy and repeatability. Specifically, they are for accuracy and repeatability of the method. And number three, they're for the process. And for the process, they're for CQAs plus productivity measures. CQAs plus productivity measures we model in those unit operations. So when we talk about DOE, remember, it's not just for the process. It's not just for process characterization. It's for analytical methods, development, and validation. Robustness studies are mandatory, required. They have to be in your development studies. Failure to, by the way, I saw the FDA come in recently. They looked at they went to a legacy program, a program that had been there for 20 years. They said, pull up your validation documents. We want to look at them. And they said, OK, really? They were written 20 years ago. Don't care. Pull them up. They pulled them up. They read through them. They said, none of these documents follow guidance. Revalidate all of your analytical methods, all of them. You have one year to do it. See ya. We'll be back in a year. So they go, oh my gosh, thank you for the love. <laughs> So then they went back in and they redid all of them. So I always say on QBD and all this stuff, you either do it correctly or you get to do it again. You either do it correctly or you do it again. Which would you rather do? I, I had somebody at lunch say, you know, this is all good, Tom, and I really like what you're saying, but I'm not sure my boss will approve. Real, it's a real, real issue. 
I said, I don't, I don't worry about that. Well, well, I worry about that. I know, but I don't worry about that because I'm right. And when I say I'm right, I'm right. So what will happen is either the agencies will contact you and make you do it correctly, or you don't get approval on something. So they have the power, the right, and the ability to make you do it properly or you don't get a play. So this is one of those areas you, you need to do it properly or you get to do it again. Which one costs more? Doing it over and over and over. And to, have you seen what I'm talking about? Well, we didn't do it right the first time, so we did it right the third time. So this is one of those things. It really is so much better to do it correctly, do it right, and then don't worry about it. And then when you get reviewed or you have to go and submit, everything's clean and good. And you don't hear the complaints and the sad stories. So we don't like sad stories. We like happy stories. So we want to be involved in that sort of work. OK. Uh, Q9 and Q6, we talked about this already. Q9 uh, is quality risk management. Q6 is how to set specifications. Q6A is for small molecule. Q6B is for biologics. Um, and make sure that your team is familiar with those and is part of the overall control strategy for how the drug is developed, how it's used. There are two basic techniques. So uh, one part of QBD is setting specs, setting limits. And I don't know how you feel about how people are setting specs at your company, but this is often a problem. Because if they set the specs too tight, we'll have high failure rates. If they set them too wide, you may not get approval. So we need to balance that out. There are two techniques for doing this. And let me uh, give you just a couple of quick ideas that might help you on, on this. And this is fundamental to the overall drug strategy. So in this first scenario, we have a statistical distribution as the way that we set specs. So we take representative batches. We take those batches and we measure them. We calculate average and standard deviation. And we set limits based on that. This is a good technique as long as two things are true. So if you want to write this down uh, well, or highlight it, it's right there. It says, number one, there has to be no observable or detectable harm in the unit processes. The assumption is the variation must be safe. So it says, this is, we've made these batches. We sent these batches into the clinic. We saw no adverse events. Everybody was OK, no safety issues, everything good. So the variation that's in these batches must be acceptable. If that's true, you can use that variation in setting the limits. So again, scenario number one says no clinical issues, no harm. Batch variation must be OK. Therefore, we can use the batch variation to set the limits. And then based on risk, if it's a really tight spec, maybe plus or minus 3 sigma, uh, the requirement is the risk is not so high, 4 sigma windows, maybe low risk, 4.5 k sigma windows, so we can set that. In scenario number two, this assumption that everything is good, this is the, what, what I call the everything must be good situation. In the second one, this one says we have the equation. We have the transfer function. We know how the variation in the factor influences the variation in the response. So based on that distribution, we can use that to set limits to guarantee that this will always meet spec. So the second one technique is referred to as a transfer function technique. Today, most of you in this room, most drug programs globally set specifications based on technique number one, this one. Only if you've done proper experimentation and characterization might you do this. So in the example I just showed you, this was using a transfer function, where we set the limits on temperature, flow, et cetera. So this is the more common one. This is less common, but also acceptable. This one is the best one. This one is the second best. This is the most common, but not as good. This is the less common, but better. This one assumes everything is good. This one can have both good and bad. If you have good and bad results, you can use this transfer function to set the limits on x to make sure that your response is going to be good every time. 
Uh, we talked about we don't want to go use CPK because the FDA said they like CPK, but they didn't know what they were talking about. So we don't use CPK or PPK. We use PPM. This is the right measure. CPK is an, a misleading, incorrect measure. This one's the right one. This is the one we want. Jump calculates that correctly, so no problem. Remember that this is your OOS rate in millions. If you divide that by a million, you get the failure rate. If you divide PPM by one million, you get the failure rate. Uh, CPKs are not additive. You can't add these. PPM is additive. So if you have a failure due to titer, you have a failure due to concentration, you have a failure due to pH, you have a failure due to uh, particle size, those can be all added up, and you can get your total failure rate. They're additive. CPKs are not additive, so we don't like them. Yep, that's what that says. Oh, this is getting good. Okay, number eight. <sighs> There's 10, only 10, promise. <laughs> There's not 15, I don't have extra ones in my pocket. Oh, I forgot these, no, no. <laughs> okay, um, robust design space and edge of failure analysis, we talked a little bit about that already. In some of these models, they can be very complicated because we can have many, 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 many CQAs. And so in a very complicated drug program, you may have many, many, many of these that you have to characterize. Each one has its own equation. Each one has its own equation. Each one has its own variation. So with the combination, by the way, as far as I know, SAS Jump is the only program that allows you to do the DOE, do the model building, do the edge of failure and the design space in one program. Uh, traditionally, we've had to use multiple programs to do that, but it's the only one that's got it all integrated. It's another reason why it's ideal for R&D, ideal for CMC, because it's easy. Once you learn it, it has everything you need right there. Okay, this is what I was talking about. There's the design space, and again, you can see that it doesn't take one graph to show it. It takes, in this example, it takes nine graphs to show it. Very, very common. Uh, to see what that looks like. Um, another one that we have to do a lot of times is NOR and PAR ranges. And a pretty big mistake that a lot of people do is they do the development and then they start working on the NOR ranges and the PAR ranges. NOR range stands for normal operating range. Normal operating range, NOR. And PAR ranges are proven acceptable range, P-A-R, proven acceptable range. Uh, those are called out by guidance. They specifically ask for them. So again, here's another uh, efficiency. Here's another thing that will speed you up. Normally what people have done is they've done the characterization and then because they did that poorly, they had to come back and start over and do PAR experiments and NOR experiments. Terrible. Uh, I was talking to a group the other day and they said in order to do all the characterization, it took them 50 additional runs at small scale to map out all the NOR and PAR. Terrible stuff. Uh, unacceptable. So as part of our DOE, if we've done the ranging widely, so if we ranged temperature widely, if we ranged concentration widely, then what we can do is say, okay, there's a good PAR range and there's a good NOR range. There's my set point and limits. So in one study, one characterization, target, Limits, simulation, PAR, and NOR, all out of one study. I call it one and done. I, we don't have the resources, people, to do as many experiments as we would like. We have to do it, but we have to do it very efficiently so that we can get the most information out of the fewest number of runs. And that's the strategy. If we do that, then the efficiency of QBD, the character, the compliance on ICH, it's easy to do. If we are trying stuff in the lab and then later doing all the characterization studies, then later doing NOR and PAR studies, that's a lot of studies, that's a lot of time, take forever. We can greatly collapse that down into a very few runs, properly risk assessed, and squeeze all that information out, take, take that piece of fruit 
squeeze it and get that 10 times information. Do you want to hear what the 10 times are? Well, I already told you some of them. So we designed the experiment. What do we get? So the first thing we get, risk assessment. Then we get the DOE design. Then we get the model. Then we get the profiler. We get the interaction profiler. We get the simulator. We get the model equation in there. We get the limits and the edge of failure. Um, we get the prediction at other set points or other conditions. We get the scale up model. So I mean, as we add those all up, you can see, comp as opposed to, I tried this, looks good. You tried this, it looks good? What do you know? You don't know anything, except it looks good. By the way, is it good to find out that it looks good? By the way, finding out it looks bad is terrible. Okay, we tried this, it doesn't work. It looks bad. Okay, fine. This is no good. We tried this, it looks good. Cool. But what makes it good? That's what we have to explain. And that's what they're looking for now. Not it works. See? That's not... Why is... When you find out it works, why is that a problem? Are you on the very bloody edge? Almost failing? You don't know. Since you don't know, what do you have to do to your limits? Make them very tight. Since you make your limits very tight, what will happen to OOS? No good. So you realize that, that really when we do the proper characterization, it helps us to open up those limits, set realistic ranges, and everything we need to know, we can get out of a very few studies. Since we can squeeze all that information out of a very few studies, it's efficient and cost effective and quick. That's what we have to learn how to do. If we don't know how to do that today, tomorrow we have to learn how to do it. Your submissions and your approvals and your reputation globally depend on it. Absolutely. It's not a maybe. It's a for sure. Go read Q8 if you don't believe what I'm saying because it will show you. And I'll, I'll pull up some Q8. I have some more Q8 to look at here in a minute. We'll see what, if what I'm saying is uh, true or no, not true. Again, the simulation, by the way, if you want to make a note on the simulation, these ranges that we're studying here in the simulation are at the set point. So if I say a set point of a temperature is, let's say, 25 degrees, or let's say that I want 34 degrees, at that temperature, what's your controllable range? That's what the simulation does. It's ask the question, what is your equipment and process ability to hit that target? What range can you control reliably? And then if that's the range, is that acceptable? And again, we run the simulation, and then you can see, yes, that's OK, or no. It needs to be much tighter for the kinds of limits that we're trying to target. We showed you this. OK, now let's move on forward. Let's talk a little bit about more on control. Number nine. Oh, this is getting better and better. We're almost there. Almost 10. OK, control strategy. What are we looking for for controls? I would still tell you today, and I would say our biggest challenge globally in pharma is using the benefit of QBD to design in the controls. This is still, um, the opportunity is still so much bigger than the reality. So the FDA has it right. The EMA has it right. They said, look, if you want better controls, you can have them. Ask for them. But you're going to need a design space, and you're going to need a control plan. So what I want to talk about is a little bit about the controls. There are, I want you to think about this. If you want to write this down, there are three very different kinds of controls. And let's, let's kind of just enumerate these quickly. Number one kind of control is traditional, release testing. That is not process control. That's called product control. So if you want good product control, you must have a good release testing panel, a good release testing protocol. No question. The second one that you want to think about for control strategy is IPCs, in-process control. But in-process control often controls nothing. It's just monitoring. Like, I want to know if everything's OK. And if there's a problem, I can stop process. So IPC can allow for stop process, but in many cases, it controls nothing. 
What could an IPC do? Well, IPC could tell you to change the way you do processing. So IPC can be used as a control, but it also can be used as monitoring. It can also be used for termination. What's the difference between a monitor and a control? Think about this for a second. This is the big deal. What's a monitor? I'm driving home, I see the road turn, and I'm just monitoring it. <laughs> monitoring does what? Nothing. What does control do? I see the road turn, I turn. I see it turn this way, I turn. So control means you actively control. Control means adjustment. Monitoring means no adjustment. Which would you rather have? Monitor or control? Control, baby, control. <laughs> yeah, we want control. Um, again, uh, you know, uh, by the way, my strategy is I need only four or five controls to run uh, from cell culture to harvest, I only need about four or five controls. And from purification to end, I only need about two or three controls. From final fill and finish to the end, I only need two or three controls. So we're not talking about hundreds of controls that we need. No, we, we're talking about four or five key controls in key processes that will guarantee we meet CQA delivery. So these are the ones. OK, so again, number one, product control is product specifications and release test panel. That's number one. Number two is IPC, and it could be either IPM, in-process monitoring, or it could be IPC, in-process control, where we're actively measuring and adjusting loads, adjusting flows, adjusting key characteristics. That's second. Third is what we call an in-process, uh, the third is what we call a feed-forward or feedback control loop. Feed-forward or feedback. And those can, and, and possibly even in situ. So those are what we call closed loop controls. The third kind is what we call closed loop controls, where we're going to have an active monitoring and adjustment protocol, closed loop. The new self-driving cars are trying to do this. Do you believe in self-driving car or you don't trust? Do they have in Korea yet or no? U.S., they're trying to do it, but I'm not sure I believe quite yet. But it's coming, coming, coming. But that's the idea, is that it's closed loop, right? We actively measure and actively adjust. Okay, so let's take a look at, to get there, the first thing we have to do is we have to understand the key sensitivities. That will give us the transfer function. No transfer function, no control. No transfer function, no control. So I need the equation on how to adjust. If I don't have the equation, I don't know. If I turn the wheel by this much, how much will it change the drug? I need the equation. I need to know if I adjust pH by this much, this is what will happen. If I adjust the temperature, this is what will happen. So I need to know how much sensitivity, temperature, pressure, flow, concentration to influence CQA. So I need that transfer function. That's a must have. Okay, and then here's our process control. So in situ, looking to actively measure and adjust while processing. Feed forward, this can be used on critical reagents or other key process areas. Feedback control can show that before I run the next batch, I should make an adjustment. And then the rule is the adjustment must maintain inside the file design space. As long as that's true, Good, no problem. That's what the agencies were talking about. Make sure your adjustments are within the filed adjustment range. So for example, when I was filing a design space with the agency, we had a target set point of 34 degrees, plus or minus three. So we said you can go from 31 degrees and you can go from to 37 degrees. This is the design space. 31 to 37, set point 34, normally. But then the cells started growing faster. So we wanted to slow them down a little bit, so we dropped the temperature. Cells were growing too slow, 
we sped up the temperature, moved a little higher. We filed the design space so we could actively change our set point to monitor and adjust the cell behavior. Why did the cells start growing faster? I have no idea why they did that. They just did. By the way, when do you need the, these controls? When do you need them? Let me give you an idea. I, I've seen this in many drug programs. How about year one? You file a program, gets approval, you start making drug. Do you need these controls instantly? No, you got new equipment, everything's been validated, everything's good. Usually year one goes pretty good for a drug program. How about year two? Uh-oh. How about year three? Oh my gosh. Because we tried to run everything the same all the time, but the reagents changed, media changed, equipment degraded, all of a sudden, and we did nothing on control. We controlled nothing. We tried to make it the same every time. If you try to make it the same every time, what's going to happen? If you try to make the drug lot exactly the same every time, what's going to happen? It will turn out differently. So what do you have to do? You have to make it different so you can make it the same. That's so weird. True. If you try to make it the same every time, but your reagents have changed, your equipment has degraded, things are moving around, by making it the same every time, you're going to go right out of control. As you go out of control, you'll go by the specifications, and then you'll be OOS, and then you'll say, what happened? Whose responsibility is it to design the control system? CMC. Who's doing it today? Nobody. Nobody is designing the control. That's who's designing your controls today. Nobody. You're assuming target and limits will control everything. Wrong. Just wait. Try it. And then watch your yields. Watch your productivity. Watch your OOS rates. Watch your program go south. And then when you see it drift and you say you have no control, what happened? And then you can blame. You can do investigations. Investigations are not control. These are not controlled by investigations. These are controlled by making small adjustments all the time. By making small adjustments, they make it good every day. This has real closed-loop process control. Drug, now the FDA knew that to make drug world-class, to be excellent, you're going to need better control than what we have today. And the way they gave it to you is they said, here's QBD, good characterization, you'll need the equation, and then we want closed loop on your control strategies. And you're going to need a design space, so we're good with that. We're going to give you a design space. You ask for it. Show us that you've mapped that out. You have it. We'll give you approval. If you need to make an adjustment to bring your process back to target, that's good with us. We're happy. As long as you use it to control your line, control your process, we're, we're good with that. We like it. If you ask for it for any other reason, fail, denied. Genentech learned this the hard way. Genentech did a QBD filing, first one they did. They did all the DOE work, everything beautiful. They uh, they're one of my customers, actually, but, so I have to be a little bit careful. But uh, they submitted to the FDA. FDA looked at their submission and says, no. Huh? It was a QBD filing. We did all the work. No. Why? Because you didn't tell us it was for control. You just said you wanted it to be easy to run. No. We don't want it easy to run. We want it for control. You didn't show us any control strategy. No. So design space, QBD, for control. Why do you need a design space? To make adjustment. When? When it drifts off target. That's why process to target is such a big idea. Because when you're off target, back on target. So you can control parametric drift. This is the essential idea. Is any drug company doing this today? Yes. Many drug companies are up and running on this concept, and they're following it exactly. Many. If you look at the opportunity, probably 80% no, 20% yes in US. My, my feeling is about 20% of the companies, they're up and running, and they're doing exactly what I'm showing you here, about 80% no. Semiconductor, 100% are doing it. They have to, no choice. Drug, but in the five years ago, maybe 2%. Now we're up to 20, maybe 25% are up and running on it. 
What will happen in the next three or four or five years? We'll see in the U.S. almost all the drug companies up and running. It's quickly changing, and particularly we see it on the gene therapy and cell therapy programs. They're on it immediately. They have to. And the traditional drug companies, the antibodies, the vaccines, slow, the small mo the, You know the people that impressed me recently, small molecule guys, really jumping on this really beautifully and really showing it in their molecular synthesis, in making the API, and then all the API integration. You saw the Merck stuff. Uh, people are really doing a good job in the small molecule space as well. But biologics is really on the, doing very, very well these days. And vaccine, not bad. Okay, again, what might be some examples? Well, we might be controlling the, the cell concentration. We might be controlling the pH and the temperature on a bioreactor. We might be monitoring in situ in the feed or the control of the bioreactor. We might be controlling the termination to hit a target uh, profile for the endpoint. Instead of harvesting on time, we might harvest to actually uh, optical density or some other key characteristic. Uh, we might harvest on titer. Downstream, we're loading the column based on titer or optical density. Uh, an adjustment may be made on column life. Uh, drug product might be changing the compounding to hit target concentration or target doses. So again, these are good examples of how closed loop controls are being actively used in drug today. I mentioned this before. In the old days, if you made it the same every time, it will come out the same. That is not true. If we try making it exactly the same, it often comes out different. And then we wonder what happened. It's, it's dumb. If you drive your car home, you don't take your car and put it perfectly in the middle of the road. Center it just beautifully. Here's the limits of the road on either side. And then punch the gas and don't touch the wheel you would commit suicide. It would be a dead person. You can't run like that. That's what the top one assumes. You just make it the same every time and it will come out the same. That's a lie. By making it the same, it will come out different. So we have to think the other way, to make small adjustments within the filed design space. We can make it the same every time. If we make small adjustments, within the, the filed design space, we can make it the same every time because we're actively controlling. Now, if it goes way out, then there's something else wrong. That's where you stop process and investigate. So we still need investigation, but it shouldn't be investigating every small deviation. This is a good picture of what a closed loop control looks like. So again, it has four key components. It has a sensor by which we're measuring. That can be an analytical method. That can be a probe. <coughs> it has a sampling procedure, how often we sample. It has a control chart. It has an alarm to trigger what the actual condition is. It has control logic that tells us how to do that. And this, this information has to be in our filing. That's what we have to tell the FDA. And the FDA, this is where the design space comes in. It comes right in in the control logic adjustable within the file design space. So that's what they want to see. If they see that you're asking for a design space for the purpose of control, if they see you're asking for a design space for any other reason, not accepted. It's not going to fly. All right, let's take a look at what they say. This is not what I say. This is what the ICH says. And I don't know if we can read this very well, but we'll try. Yeah, it's good enough. So if you look over here, this is right out of ICH. And let's see if it, if it ties together with what I've been saying. So first of all, over pharma overall pharmaceutical development. Now, the one thing you have to appreciate, this was written, I, th I have to double check. I think it was written in 2006. But they were saying that this is the minimal approach and this is the enhanced approach. That was before in 2013 when the agency said QBD is no longer uh, optional. It's just part of ICH, it's a, all submissions must have the QBD components in it. Follow ICH. So <clears throat> this is a little bit old in the way it's written, but it's still okay. It says overall pharmaceutical development, mainly empirical development of research done one factor at a time. So it says, what should you be doing? Systematic relating mechanistic understanding. That's a risk assessment of input material attributes and process parameters to CQA. So 
it needs to have a risk assessment. Multivariate experiments to understand product. What is that? Formulation. They say product, but what's the product understanding? Formulation. Because the formulation and the analytical methods map out the product and the process, right? Our process unit operations. The establishment of a design space. For what purpose? P-A-T, process analytical technology for control. So they say design space and then they say control. And then what they say, what about the manufacturing process? Fixed, don't touch it, no change. But over here it says adjustable within the design space. For what reason? Control. Life cycle approach to validation, ideally continuous process verification. Focus on the control strategy and robustness. Use of statistical process control methods. So you can see when we talk about QBD, it is really all about gaining the understanding, putting it into the filings, and then pulling out the control strategy and beef up the control strategy. Really put some strength into the control strategy, not just release testing. IPC, closed loop controls to make sure that every day drug is good, every day on target. Okay, um, product specifications, primary means of control. Nah, it's really part of the overall control strategy, but not just for that. The control strategy, whew, <laughs> they love control. <laughs> drug product quality ensured by risk-based control strategy for well understood product and process. Quality control shifted upstream with the possibility of simplifying your test. Wow. Do they want DOEs? Yes. Do they want risk assessments? Yes. Do they want you to have better control strategies? Yes. This is not me saying it. This is right out of Q8, R2, and this is their table. Today, there is almost, I know of no client that I work with globally and I mean no client, I have no client today that thinks this is right, that this will be enough. This is not enough. Today, this is what we're doing, and the only question is how much and how completely are we doing it. So if you think that your group is not fully on board, your management team is not fully on board, they do not understand modern drug manufacturing or development today, that is what we're doing today. That is what is required in the BLA. The BLA wants a section that explains in detail your product knowledge, and they want another section that details your process understanding, and they want another section that details process control strategy. So we have to explain to them in the regulatory filing those three elements that has to be mapped out and explained. If we show this level of uh, sophistication, it is a beautiful story, and it shows what we know. If we don't show that, or we just show little bits of it and expect that that gives a good story, it will not give a good story. And that's why the line of sight is so important because I can go from the QTPP, CQA, high level risk assessment with unit operations with risk, low level risk assessment, unit operations that are characterized, transfer function, design space, edge of failure, and control plan. Beautiful line of sight. Without that, I just have stuff. I don't know what stuff is in Korean, but just things to talk about. But it doesn't tell the story. Does it show a complete understanding? No. Does it explain what you didn't do? No. So that's why line of sight is so important because it will explain what we did, but it will also explain what we didn't do and why we didn't do it. And that's important, too, because we want to show a complete, thoughtful understanding of how to develop these drugs and how to communicate it to regulatory authorities that we're ready. We're ready for GMP. We're ready to go make this drug. We're going to hurt nobody. We're going to make sure it's safe. We're going to make sure it's effective. And it has all the moving parts so that it has value to the customers. Ah, number 10. This is the best one. <laughs> the last one. So the last thing that kind of goes in here is the continuous improvement and the validation. Now, a key measure that we should always consider in this, in this step number 10 is something called process capability. 
process capability. And again, if you remember in the FDA's QBD wheel, they said at the end, when you get to the end, it's really all about control. And what's the measure of control? It's called process capability, PPM. So we measure that in parts per million, OOS rate in PPM. That's the measure. So that's what we're going to be monitoring. Um, there's guidance right now that's being drafted for quality metrics. If you want to go Google that or you want to read up on it, uh, what is your, your Google is not Google here, it's Naver. What's the one that they use here in, what's the Google in Korea, Naver? Is it? Baidu in China, Naver here, I don't know what it is in Japan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so my, my, when I was growing up, I, my sister could not say the name neighbor. So she called all our neighbors, neighbors. So I was going, when I first heard neighbor, I'm going, is it like a neighbor? They go, no, no, no. <laughs> I go, okay, okay. So, all right. So um, this is something that will help us is to get these measures of capability. Here's a good picture. Again, this is not from me. This is from AMAB. Um, but basically it kind of says, here's how they see it. Here's what they consider to be the line of sight. This is not from me. This is from another uh, group. But target product profile. Uh, CQAs, and then how your clinical knowledge fits together. Here's your risk assessment. And then they, I disagree with this a little bit because they're not showing how the formulation really fits in here, but that's okay. That's just their limited thinking. And then they're showing that the risk management and the design space is for the characterization and control. And then they come in and lay out the control plan. And then the continuous process verification would be used to say, make sure on a day-to-day -day basis, week after week, month after month, how do you know the process is okay? So again, statistical process control, um, tracking and trending, um, using capability measures, those are usually the key things that we want to monitor. All right, so how does it all fit together? So again, here they are. Number one, get your target product profile put together. Number, and your QTPP, define your CQAs for both your clinical and your product. Make sure for DS and DP. Define the scale and the process at all, at all levels. Um, and then link your material attributes, do your assay ID, uh, your formulation, the stability materials, your unit process and equipment, your high level risk assessments, your low level risk assessments, your DOE work, develop the control strategy, and your process validation. Now, the one thing that this doesn't show is scale up. So usually, this right after you define the design space and you've mapped out, the, so on step number nine, between nine and 10 is we call scale up. And that's where we're gonna take it from the two liter up to the 10,000 liter or the 2,000 liter scale. Um, and I, I work on small molecule as well. Almost everything is done at a small reactor size, and then they go to a full-scale reactor, small bioreactor, full-scale bioreactor, and so forth. Scale-up is important. And being able to show that there's a direct connection between the small scale and the at-scale model is super, super critical. So I'm going to ask you to write one note here, and it's called model calibration. Model calibration. So when you take the small scale, two liter work or whatever scale you used, and then you compare that to your at scale, in many cases there's an additional calibration you need to do. And that calibration either does, it's usually one of two things. Either there's a correction for the intercept. In other words, the general sensitivity is correct but there's an offset in the impurity level, there's an offset in titer, there's an offset in some quality attribute. It's, it's the same sensitivity, but it's shifted, so you need to correct for the difference in the intercept. It may also be that there needs to be a difference in the slope. In other words, the sensitivity is just a bit off. The model's correct at that small scale, but it doesn't really match the sensitivity we see at scale. So we may need to provide a slope correction for those models. And in the third case, you need maybe both an intercept and a slope correction. That will then make the small scale model exactly match the at scale performance so that we can do all the prediction at scale. So that little, and again, there's a paper on that. I just recommend that you Google that if you want to find it. Maybe neighboring will find it as well. I don't know. But, but Google will find it for sure. And uh, put, put in my name, put in at scale 
and it will pop up a little paper that explains step by step how do you calibrate a small scale study and make it match your at scale equipment. Because if you can show this, think about that. You did a bunch of two liter studies, but you can exactly predict what will happen at 2,000 liters. Amazing. And it, it does work because it's the same science. The factors that matter at small scale are the factors that matter at scale. But the sensitivity may be a little bit off. So we have to know how to correct for that. Okay, and then again, the validation work and then the continuous monitoring and control. Uh, this is again from, uh, this is again from the FDA. Uh, people wrote in a question, what QBD elements are required, what are optional? So they said, this you must include in your filings. Number one, you must show your QTPP. It's got to be in your filings. And they've also clarified, this isn't in this slide, but it also says CQAs also. So QTPP and CQAs must be in your regulatory filings, period. So those must be there. The process, the product design and, understand, and knowledge, the process design and understanding has to be in there. So usually when we talk about product, it's two things. All the information on formulation and stability and all the information on your analytical methods and its characterization. That's your product. And then your process is the high level risk assessment, low level risk assessment, your DOE work, your formulas, your design space, all that is your process understanding. And then finally, we take out of that process understanding and put it into your control strategy. And please don't forget, there are two types of controls we must have process controls and analytical method controls. Because if you're not running the standards and your system suitability on those methods, you're going to be out of control on the method and you're going to think it's process when in fact it's the method. So we need two kinds of controls when we go to run and that is the control of the assays, the bioassay, the analytical methods, and also the unit operations in the process. And again, I don't expect, if you had more than 10 design spaces filed, I would be surprised. I'm thinking five, six, seven, eight design spaces you're going to need, no more. It's not like you need 22 things. You don't need 22 things. You need four, five, six, seven, eight, less than 10. And you have your whole control strategy mapped out for your entire drug program. Beautiful. And if something drifts, that's okay. We can correct it. We have the tools to do it. We know how to monitor it. We know how to detect it. We know how to correct it. We know how to monitor it. We know how to detect it. We know how to correct it. But it has to be part of our file design space. Then what's going to happen to our OOS rates? I had a drug program. This is totally true story. I had a drug program contact me and said, Dr. Tom, we have a problem. I said, OK. Uh, we have a high failure rate. OK. Uh, can you help us fix it? Sh should be able to, I think so. Let me take a look. Right? So I came out to the facility, I looked at it. 75% failure, 25% success. They hired three consultants. One consultant was expert on microbiology. The second expert on analytical methods, then there was me. And I I'm kind of good at all of them. So and anyway, I looked through everything, I took a look at it, and, I, and they said, here's what we think, and the second consultant said, here's what we think, and I said, this is what I think. And they said, okay, they fired all of us. They fired me, they fired the second consultant, they fired the first consultant. They, everybody got fired, and we said, okay, I don't care. And a year later, they call me up, oh, remember your report? Yeah, remember the, all the things you told us to do? Yeah, we're ready to do it. Oh, why? FDA told us we have to do it. Okay, I'll come back. So we went back in. We did all the things that you see here that we had to do. No choice. FDA said we want it too, and they approved us working on it. So we went in and we fixed everything. They ran nine, uh, when I last kind of talked to them, they, they run about 17 batches a week. It's a funny process, but they run 17 batches. It's a biologics process, but they run 17, what they call sublots. They run 17 of the week, and then they integrate them into a pooled lot. In a year, no OSs, nothing. 75% fail down to nothing in a year. Now, how did that happen? It happened with really, really good solid analytical methods with good controls, 
and it happened by putting a few good controls in their manufacturing line to make sure that when drifts occur, they knew how to detect and correct. No specifications were changed. We changed no specs. All specifications the same. We went from 75% fail to no fails. Never see it. Doesn't happen. Now, remember that the FDA and EMA both consider OOS is patient safety and efficacy risk. So if you have a high OOS rate, they're very unhappy because they believe you're putting your patients at risk. And that's why it's so important for us as well. Curriculum. If you were to do tra QBD training at your facility, what is it that, so we do globally training, technical training, and we do consulting. So about half of our time we're working on directly working with the teams on the development, and about half the time we're, we're doing technical training for people. This is the typical curriculum that we do. You have just completed the first session. Good for you, all done. So introduction to QBD and critical quality attributes, you just finished this one. So one of your training objectives complete. So no need to attend further. The s from here on down are the other courses that we'd normally go through. So statistical met methods and data analysis, design of experiments, mixture design of experiments, analytical methods, development and validation, uh, quality risk management and risk assessments, uh, root cause analysis and CAPA. So you can see that this is a very, very comprehensive program and it's designed for CMC teams specifically. It's designed to teach them QBD and to be able to be able to apply it in their day-to-day -day work. A normal training session takes about three to four weeks to go through. Three to four weeks. It's usually spread out. We'll do a week, come back in a month or two, do another week, come back in a month or two, do another week until you're complete. So it depends on the group what, they, what they're focusing on, but a typical scenario is three to four weeks of sessions. They should be able to do it. And then back up on consulting where they need it, and then, so this is what that looks like. Um, training is never easy. Training is never easy. There's no time to train people. But then again, there's no time to do it twice or three times or to do it wrong. So again, it's one of those necessary evils. Not easy, but necessary. So again, this is what a typical training scenario looks like. And again, this would be a typical deployment strategy. This is a five session. We do three sessions sometimes, we do four sessions, so it depends on the group. We customize that a little bit based on the needs or what the interest is. But session one is almost always the same and session two is almost always the same. Sessions one and two, we almost never change at all. That would be your first two sessions. And then after that, depends on what we're working on. If you're focusing more on the validation of the analytical methods, if you're ready for the design characterization, if you're worried, ready to work on stability analysis, we would have different topics for different people depending on what we do. So this is a good picture of what, if you said, I want to make sure our team is good at doing this, uh, and again, we do this globally. We do it in Korea. We do it in China. We do it in Japan. Uh, we do it in Singapore. We do it in Malaysia, uh, in the Asia Pacific area, and then we do it a lot in Europe, and we do it a tremendous amount in the United States. So this is where we do most of this training globally. And a lot of that training we've already done with uh, KBio has been through a lot of this training, and some of the participants from KFDA have also been participating in some of these sessions as well. So I think this is like the third year we've been actively working in the implementation in Korea. So they are helping to sponsor this as well for you. And you notice here it's a com combination of classroom with application. It does people no good to attend training if they're not actively developing drug. So in most cases, we're training, but actually we're doing work content at the same time. So if we teach you how to do a risk assessment, we should probably use it to do the risk assessment for the drug program. So that way we get something done. So it's not just training, it's training with application. Again, if you, were to, if you said, oh, we want to do that, well, then make sure that we know what we're going to do, make sure who owns it, Make sure that there's uh, integration into the normal CMC work that's going to go in. And at the end of the day, we need SOPs. So in most cases, after people learn how to do a lot of this stuff, they'll develop SOPs for how we do it day to day and that it's mandatory for everybody in the company to do it. 
Thank you very much. I hope that you uh, enjoyed the session, got some good ideas, stimulated some thinking, and uh, you probably heard some things that made you very comfortable. Yeah, we're doing that great. And you probably felt some things that made you very uncomfortable that we're not doing that. And that's okay too. That's the first step is recognition. And then you can take that into something amazing later. So thanks so much. And then we can open that up for questions. Huh? 혹시 질문 있으신 분들 있으시면?